Good evening and uh, welcome to um, another in the uh, Center for the Study of Economic Liberty lecture um, series called Perspectives on Economic Liberty. I'm uh, Dr. Ross Emmett. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty. The Perspectives lecture series emerges from the Center's mission, which is to evaluate the contribution economic liberty makes to human betterment. Our goal is to be a leader in research that affects liberty-enhancing policy, increases public and academic awareness of the history and philosophy of economic liberty, and leads to more voluntary bottom-up governance. I should add that we are approaching self-seeking, self-serving uh, announcement. I should add that we are approaching Sun Devil Giving Day on March 19th. This is the day the university makes a big push for people to make donations to activities around campus. And we hope that you would consider a contribution to the center's mission as part of your gift that day. Uh, and of course, any other time, but that's the day that the uh, university really counts things. Um, our guest speaker today is Sandy Aikida. He has made, uh, sorry, he's an Austrian economist educated at Grove City College. Uh, he actually studied with Hans Senholtz. That name means something to me, but it might not to you. And, um, and also at New York University. And he pub has published in the Review of Austrian Economics, the Independent Review, the Journal of Economic and Humane Studies, among others. He's now a professor at uh, Purchase College, which is one part of the State University of New York system, located in Westchester County, New York. Sandy has made a career out of investigating from an Austrian market-oriented perspective the potential for government intervention. He has sought to create a theory of intervention from a perspective that is anti-intervention, opposed to centralized control over economic life. So one of, the ways, one of the ways we might ask this question is, what kind of intervention would someone whose general persuasion is anti-interventionist accept? Yeah. That, takes us, that takes us close to thinking about Jane Jacobs. Living in New York City and working in the broader New York area, it's perhaps not surprising that Sandy has uh, turned his attention to the study of the economy of cities especially in the tension between the seemingly obvious need for centralized city design and planning and the spontaneous order that emerges without centralized design in neighborhoods, um, et cetera, et cetera. And in that light, Jane Jacobs is an obvious person whose work suggests consideration. Jacobs' writings span several disciplines, including ethics and most especially economics. But she is best known for her contributions to and her critique of urban planning, design, and policy. Sandy organized a symposium on Jacobs a few years ago in the journal Cosmos and Taxis, and he continues to consider her work, and that's the basis for his uh, lecture today. So join me in welcoming Sandy Aikida home to to uh, uh, the Phoenix area, he grew up in this area, and to ASU and the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty. I was born and raised and grew up in Mesa, Arizona, and I bounced around the country and ended up in New York City, in Brooklyn, um, and so it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm actually on sabbatical, and I'm spending some time right now at the, uh, at the other university that's not that has Arizona in the title, <laughs> it's, and it's not NAU. <laughs> no, I grew up a Sun Devil fan, so. Um, but I'm, I'm based there for uh, a few weeks, and I'm very, as I say, very glad to come here. Um, I'm writing a book on the um, economics and social theory of Jane Jacobs. And I'm, I assume some of you here uh, are familiar with James Jacobs, and, and that's why you're here, but I know that uh, a lot of you are not. And so what I want to do is spend some time, uh, first of all, ta talking about who she is, okay? And I want to talk about uh, why it's important that we recognize that she is an economist. Then I want to talk about what her economics is, what makes it different, and why it's important. And I'll say something about 
of things that she may have left out, maybe something that's lacking in her economics, a little bit of a critique. Uh, and at some point, um, Ro uh, uh, Ross mentioned that I'm a, an Austrian uh, economist. I, I, uh, my teachers were Israel Kersner and as he mentioned, Hans Senholz. And I've worked in that tradition you know, for all my 34 years of, of teaching. And um, uh, it, it uh, struck me when I was first started reading Jacobs how much her thought resonated with the work of Kersner and Hayek, for example. So I'll, I'll say something about that. I, I could, you know, uh, talk uh, a great deal at length on, on each of these um, topics. But let me start with who she is, or was. She passed away about uh, 14 years ago. I had a, um, the, a chance to meet her in her home in Toronto. And I asked her what she thought her most significant contribution to the world of ideas was. And she answered immediately, economic theory. Okay. Now, that's significant because um, most people associate Jane Jacobs with uh, her urbanism. She was a, an activist, um, that's her. Um, in New York City, she uh, protested uh, a lot of the policies of, of the uh, urban planning director, uh, Robert Moses, in um, extending highways in various parts of, of New York City, uh, of widening streets and destroying uh, public spaces, and in particular, Penn Station, a magnificent Beaux-Arts architectural edifice uh, that was uh, raised. It's where Madison Square Garden now sits. So um, people associate her with this book. Uh, it's her first, it's the book that made her famous, published in 1961, called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Okay, so uh, it's the death and then the life, things that both kill and then also foster urban vitality. Uh, great American cities. So she focused on American cities, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, and she focused on great cities. And by great, basically you can think of big, innovative, creative cities. Um, if you want some kind of benchmark, think about a, a, a municipality of, about, uh, of over a million people. Okay, so today, uh, you know, think of the, the, the top five or top 10 uh, uh, municipalities, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, Phoenix, Philadelphia, and so forth, Houston, Dallas, uh, San Jose, others uh, in, that, in that category. And if you include the, uh, muni uh, the, uh, the MSA or the urbanized area, probably you'd have to double that, but the orders in that first top 10 will, would, would change, but basically you have the same, uh, you have the same uh, metro uh, areas represented among the great cities. So these are uh, areas that are, um, have a dense population, a large population, but they also create. These are areas that have industry, commerce, uh, arts, and culture. All right, so she's best known for this sort of urbanism associated with great cities, but her lessons uh, are applicable to cities all over the world, not just the United States and not just during the 1950s and 60s when she was uh, making these particular observations. Um, so it, it's, it's general in that sense. But this, I'm writing the book because most people don't realize her contribution to economic theory. Right? So let me um, then talk about why is it necessary to point this out. In a sense, it's pretty obvious that economics is central to her thinking about how social orders work, how cities work. Because, for example, her second major book came out uh, eight years later in 1969 called The Economy of Cities. Okay, it's a very theoretical economic book. Uh, and then in 1984, she published Cities and the Wealth of Nations, right, echoing Adam Smith's great tome. Uh, and then in 2000, she published The Nature of Economies. Right, so clearly, economics is central to her thinking. And it's not surprising then that she would regard herself as, among other things, an economist and that her contributions 
to the world of ideas were primarily, or at least centrally, had to do with economics. Finally, if you look at the way, um, sorry, not finally, but if you look at uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities, the 1961 book, you know, that doesn't have the word economy in it. But in the first part of that book, she says this, right? Part one is uh, principally about the social behavior of people in cities and is necessary for understanding what follows. So this is the part where she talks about uh, eyes on the street or sidewalk ballet. These are phrases that are associated with her. All right, that's part one. Part two, she says, is principally about the economic behavior of cities and is the most important part of the book. Right? So even in her first book, she's uh, emphasizing the economic. Okay, and then finally, in, um, as evidence from her, her 1969 book, The Economy of Cities, she defines a city in this way. There are different ways of defining cities, right? You can define it uh, philosophically, you can define it sociologically, you can define it biologically. But this is the way she chooses to define it, given her interest and in the questions that she asks about social orders. She says, a city, oh, and by the way, I like to, uh, use the term living city, and I'll be using that term um, throughout. So it's a great city or a living city. What's the difference? Well, a living city is one that generates ideas and innovates and creates. It's roughly associated with wealth generation, creating wealth and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so Washington, D.C. Uh, wouldn't be a living city in this sense since it survives on taxation and transfers. So ancient Rome would be another uh, example of a parasitic city. Uh, it's, it's not that these aren't cities, okay, but these are not cities of innovation and creativity, at least as we normally understand it. Okay, so she defines a living city as a settlement that consistently generates its economic growth from its own local economy. Okay, so this is how she chooses to define it. Okay, well, you know, she self-identifies as an economist. Well, is that sufficient to uh, now give her credibility as an economist. Well, let me give you some other evidence here. She's cited by uh, Robert Lucas, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1995, in a paper in the Journal of Monetary Economics in 1988. I, I won't read you the quotation, but it's a significant uh, citation that he, she, he finds inspiration in her work and that she th he thought that her uh, uh, work on, on social capital and, and human capital as an extension of, uh, sorry, social capital as an extension of human capital. Jane Jacobs, I believe, coined the term social capital, was a, uh, a way to, to go uh, in, in economists interested in economic development. Um, <clears throat> she also inspired the uh, Harvard uh, urban economist, uh, Ed Glazer. Uh, who's, who's uh, published numerous articles that uh, cite uh, Jacobs as an inspiration. And if that weren't enough, she herself published an article in 1969 in the American Economic Review. How many of us have published an article in Economic <laughs> Review? Okay, this is one of the premier journals in the economics profession. Okay, so uh, it's, it was a big deal. By the way, uh, Ed Glazer and uh, his colleagues published an article about what he called Jacob Spillovers in the Journal of Political Economy, another uh, premier journal, uh, specifically citing her. Okay, so what else can we do to establish uh, uh, Jacobs' economics creds? Um, I mentioned before that I've, I've taught economics uh, for over 30 years. Um, in my introductory economics courses, I frame the lessons in terms of what I call the central question of economics. And it goes like this. How in the presence of scarcity, human and natural diversity, and imperfect knowledge, does social order emerge among myriad self-interested strangers? That's what I think economics needs to explain. How do you get social order among self-interested strangers where resources are scarce, knowledge is imperfect, and so forth. Okay, so what does Jacobs have to say about all this? What about, um, oops, go wrong way. 
Scarcity, well, you know, she's not a magical thinker. Some, some people engage in magical thinking. Uh, you know, we want free education, we want free health care, and so forth, without considering the uh, scarcity resources, that these things have a cost, that there are trade-offs, that there are choices that have to be made. She, she was well aware of this. She understood the role of prices as signaling scarcity. And she wrote, wrote about this in her 2000 book, The Nature of Economies. Um, human and natural diversity. Well, those who have read Jacobs know that um, one of the main things that she was concerned about was diversity within cities. And what she meant by diversity primarily was land use diversity. Different uses of space within a city, and the greater the diversity, other things equal, the more likely it is that people are able to make discoveries, put things together that they would not ordinarily see. Imperfect knowledge. Uh, Jacobs argues that cities are places where ideas emerge because of experimentation because of trial and error. If you have perfect knowledge, why do you need to experiment? If you have perfect knowledge, why do you need to innovate? Right? Because you already, your knowledge is already perfect. So her whole approach presupposes that knowledge is not perfect, that we have to do this sort of uh, trial and error, failure, 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 success, and so forth, in order to uh, achieve um, creativity. And <clears throat> social order. Okay? She, in um, Death of Life of Great American Cities, chapter 22, she characterizes cities as um, phenomena of, of organized complexity. That cities consist of numerous but countable variables that interact with each other, such that what emerges are patterns, uh, peaceful cooperation. Um, you have, with the city itself is a, an order. And within the city order, people pursue their plans, they, they form businesses, they form uh, different kinds of groups. And these are usually mostly unplanned, these are informal. Uh, informal. Uh, we have this gathering here today, which is partly formal, partly informal. All these kinds of things happen. Businesses are this way. So these happen continuously in cities in very uh, unpredictable ways. So her concern was with cities in this, in this, in this uh, fashion. And then finally, we talk about strangers. Uh, in in um, her uh, Death and Life book, um, in chapter two, which has to do with sidewalks and contact, the word stranger appears 37 times. In the first 100 pages of the book, the word stranger appears uh, you know, over 40 times. So uh, it was something that was certainly of concern to her. Now, economists are concerned about this because if you think about economies, people hear about the phrase, uh, use the phrase, the impersonality of the market. Right? You're buying from people that you may know or not, but to, in order to get that loaf of bread, you have to have the cooperation of the farmer, or the truck driver, the person who provides the, the, the fuel. All these things have to come together the, it's just the tip of the, the bread is just the tip of the iceberg. And so you're dependent on this tremendous network, uh, dynamic network of uh, supply chains. And also on the demand side, right? all these people are coming together buying who are strangers to one another. They're competing with one another, but, and they're doing so peacefully. So this is, the, this is what economics is concerned about, this, this particular problem, how to solve it. Okay, so. According to this criteria, then, uh, Jacobs is a, an economist. One final thing about uh, social order in the uh, central question. Uh, chapter one of her 1969 book, um, The Economy of Cities, talks about how cities emerge over time as an unintended consequence, how uh, the city itself is an evolved phenomenon and then also how agriculture and other industries and other activities within the city also emerge unplanned and spontaneously. Right? So the last chapter of her first major book and the first chapter of her next book complement each other. The last chapter talks about the, the complexity of cities. The first chapter of her next book talks about how that complexity emerges from the actions of individuals. Okay. So. She, let's say she's an economist then. 
What is her economics exactly? Now, I can't spell it all out. I'll try to give you uh, a, a taste of it. And why is it important? Right? OK, she's, she's an economist. She has a particular uh, contribution to economic theory that's largely ignored, uh, with notable exceptions. But why, why is this important? Well, first of all, her economics is uh, at odds with most of standard economics. Um, for one thing, her focus is on economic development. Now, sure, economists talk about economic development. Robert Lucas famously talked about economic development. Um, Paul Romer, right, had, very famous for Nobel, another Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, famous for, uh, who's also interested in cities, by the way, famous for his models of, of economic development. Jacobs is a little bit different in that for, for her, economic development is primarily based on innovation and creativity. Economists also talk about innovation. But in the way that Jacobs frames it, this innovation is unpredictable. This innovation is based on certain institutional conditions, which I'll talk about in a minute. And when you put these institutional conditions together, uh, along with the diversity of cities, you have this unpredictable, emergent, um, creative innovation that comes about. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a different sort of, of uh, starting point for economics. If you've learned, many of you, uh, I'm sure, have studied economics and you learn about equilibrium prices and equilibrium quantities, and you talk about perfect competition and so forth. These are the standard models and theories of economics. But um, for her, she just sort of swats that away. So this is not what's important about the real world. What's important is she doesn't use the word entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, but that's what she means, discovery of profit opportunities, of trial and error, experimentation. So it's a very different starting point. Economic development is innovation. Innovation is based on trial and error within the context, the institutional context of the city. That trial and error and experiment uh, survives because within cities there are social networks, social capital, that bring novel information into the city. Um, cities are places where weird people like to congregate because of its on anonymity and because of the opportunities that are there. Uh, you can remake yourself in a city. You can um, reinvent yourself. You know, your, your neighbors and your friends and your family aren't around to see what you're doing. Right? So you can, you, there's this tremendous opportunity uh, for recreation in, in cities. So people are attracted to it. Um, and then you form, you, so you break old social ties and you form new social ties in, in cities. And it's these networks of ties. It, the greater the city, the more social networks you belong to, right? There's the university, there's the club, there's your family, there's maybe a religious group, there's like recreational activities. These are, uh, there are a myriad of these and they're changing all the time. Okay. Much more so than in, a, let's say, a rural area, a small town, say. Um, and so this kind of experimentation uh, fosters discovery. You have no novel information through new people and new ties. And then if you discover something, everybody will know about it, even if you don't know them, if it's impersonal, because it's, it's diffused. This information, the discovery is diffused through these same social networks. Um, Again, so dif discovery and diffusion implies that there, are, there is social capital. And I have here social capital non-foundations of market processes. So this is another thing that's different about Jacobs's um, uh, approach and her economics. It's, it's urban-based, that is, she studies cities and see, to see how they work. And she realized that there are these social networks and there are these norms that undergird the social networks, um, depending on what the social network is. You have to have, let's say, norms of reciprocity. You have to have norms of trust. Um, you need to have norms of fair dealing and honesty. Okay, now these, strictly speaking, are not economics. We do, we do associate economics, with, uh, at least uh, uh, within the last 50 years or so, with institutions, property rights, contracts, uh, things that reduce transactions costs. Okay, these are familiar to economists. But what she's talking about 
are, are these, um, of the, the social networks and trust. Okay, that is, you know, you can have a market economy without a great deal of trust. It's just that it's going to be very, you don't make any long-term loans if you lack trust. You don't do, you know, long-term planning among strangers if there's lack of trust. But you could still have exchange, right, primitive exchange. But if you can foster trust, if, you, if cities can uh, generate safety and security and trust spontaneously, then you can, uh, uh, markets will flourish. Right? So for flourishing market processes, you need to have these non-market foundations. Now those, uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Vernon Smith and other experimental economists. Uh, one of the things that he does, uh, Vernon Smith, Nobel Prize winner, uh, is precisely to look at, uh, among other things, uh, trust games. So to what extent and what kinds of trust in different kinds of contexts are necessary for people to associate with one another. Okay, so that, he got his Nobel Prize for that. Uh, the experimental method, but that's one of the things that was part of it. Um, so Jacobs was one of the uh, original, uh, uh, one of the first in modern economics to bring this back in. She wasn't the first, of course. The first would be Adam Smith. Right, who talked about sympathy and the, the basis uh, for uh, market economies on interpersonal reliance and things of that nature. But it's interesting, a lot of Smith's uh, ideas uh, have been forgotten in economics. In, 20, in the evolution of 20th century economic theory, uh, these non-market bases, sympathy and so forth, the institutions that uh, underlie markets were kind of, uh, you know, they're put aside to uh, at, at the, uh, uh, and, and instead was, was placed uh, formalism, emphasis on equilibrium, emphasis on optimization, and, and modeling, and that sort of thing, and, and, which is fine. Right? This, you can gain a lot that way, but you're, you're, you're losing a lot of the details that are necessary to fully understand social orders. And so looking at the city, uh, looking at the uh, economics through the city, brings us all back in. So another way of looking at it, right, what does tying economics to the city, as Jacobs does, as her economics does, what does it buy you? Well, it shows that the city itself is an important economic institution, okay? The city, I'll make this point again in, in a couple minutes, but the city is a natural unit of economic analysis in, a, in the same way that the household is, that the business, that a business is. Um, that an individual is. The city is the same way. Um, again, the non-market foundations of market processes, norms of, of, of reciprocity, trust, and so forth, and also uh, social capital and social networks. And then the third thing here is place, process, complexity, and spontaneous order. These things are brought in by Jacobs by looking at the city, right? You locate activities, the locus of economic activities is in space, in a place like this. There's, you can't do anything without a place. So that suggests that this place has to be amenable to the kinds of activities that you want to do. So this room, for example, is set up in such a way that you can give lectures in it. But it's flexible because I can see you can move the chairs, you can have study sessions, you can do other things. You can have a dance in this room because of its flexibility. You couldn't do that, let's say, in, oh, I don't know, Gamage Auditorium. It's, it's set up to do a specific thing. Um, so you have this kind of flexibility. Secondly, um, so that's a city as an institution. And um, sorry, place in the process, you're looking at evolution of social orders over time. Okay, so you have logical connections that are taking place unpredictably, but this is through time. Right? You, can, you can trace back um, something like uh, the discovery of agriculture um, to its uh, priors. But you couldn't go the other way. You can't predict from what's now to what's going to happen in the future. So th because this is a, a time-consuming uh, process that's taking place. Okay? And complexity and spontaneous order I've also I've mentioned. So I'll just go ahead. What, um, I was going to, uh, th there's a uh, slide for each of these, but let me, uh, in the interest of time, focus on cities as an institution. 
Those of you who have read Jacobs, particularly The Death and Life of Great American Cities, re should recognize these four conditions or four genera generators of diversity. Again, what's so important about diversity, land use diversity for Jacobs? It's what uh, allows people to uh, uh, discover new things, both from the supply side, right? If you want to put a band together, you find people who fit into the uh, criteria that you need. You need a bass player, you need a drummer, and, and all that sort of thing. Or the kinds of music on the, you know, that, you know, in, in, in determining what inputs to put together. But also on the demand side, um, you have diversity of tastes, right? You can produce a lot of novel things, but if nobody wants to consume them, nobody wants to buy them, then you're not going to do very well. That's why. Uh, restaurateurs come to New York and Paris and they try out novel things because there are rich people who are tired of the old stuff and want to consume new stuff. Okay, I think we see, we see this happening in Phoenix a lot, right? Different kinds of restaurants. When I was uh, 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 a boy, I have my, my brother and my sister here, when they were, uh, we were growing up, Mesa had a population of about 30,000, right? 30,000, 35,000. And today it's approaching half a million and it's becoming a great city. So these things evolve over time and uh, require diversity. Okay, so how do you get diversity? Well, one thing is to, you, have to have, you have to generate safety and trust within a place, within a neighborhood. Jacob says the best way to do that is to attract people. People attract people, and the more people there are, then you sort of have naturally evolving security and safety. You're less likely to do something bad if you know you're being watched. So she says, first of all, then you need a reason for people who, to come into your neighborhood, a museum, uh, a business, uh, an office, residential uses that will bring outsiders in. Then you need intricacy of street patterns. She said short blocks. Um, this, uh, again, on the supply side, offers uh, exposure to, if you're an artist, or particularly if you're a business uh, person, uh, exposure. Now, uh, our father used to say, uh, if you're gonna buy real estate, buy it on the corner. That's a common kind of idea. Why? Because you get more people passing by your establishment if you're on a corner. It's, the, the other things equal, the price of a, of a corner uh, will, uh, will be higher than on an interior lot. Okay? So there's, on the supply, on the demand side, People who are, let's say, shopping, to get from point A to point B in a neighborhood, there are different ways of going, not just one straight line. Right? There are things that will catch your eye and you can have greater variety. So if there is greater variety, you can see it's, uh, it's more likely to take place if you have intricacy of streets and you um, uh, are able to get to it without too much trouble. You're gonna, you can be in a car, but she was take, talking mainly about walking. But uh, you uh, uh, need to have that on the demand side, those alternatives. Some of, some of this is um, reflected in the construction of shopping malls. Back, back in the 60s, when they were building shopping malls, basically they were the, like straight malls. Right? There's like J.C. Penney at one end and whatever at the other end. And you could, you know, it's like whatever it was, 100 yards from one point to the other. Then mall designers got savvy. They said, if you see that you have to walk 100, 200 yards from one point to another, you probably want to get in your car and drive over there. And then once you get in your car, you could go anywhere. Right? So the mall designer says, let's make it hard for people to see more than 100 feet in front of them. Um, so if you go to like Arizona Mills Mall, <laughs> you can't, it's circular, right? So you, you keep walking. You, don't, you can't see how far you've come. You can't see how far you have to go. So it kind of, that design, um, uh, sort of imitates the street in intricacy. Uh, buildings that are old and worn out. Jacob says, new ideas need old buildings. Why is that? Well, basically, you have to have space. If you have new ideas, generally speaking, you're probably young and you don't have much wealth. So if you're a band, you're gonna start off in a garage or a basement. If you're you know, starting a new business, you want an old warehouse someplace. Uh, or old office. So if, if it's old and worn down, the rent's going to be lower, 
and you're more likely to be able to experiment there. So experiment has to have a place. And then high concentrations of people to populate the streets at different times of the day. Right? So these four things together, Jacobs argues, can generate diversity over time. It makes the public spaces, the streets, sidewalks, plazas feel safe because there are people out there. And it, cities have done this, she said, naturally over millennia. This is generally how it happens. What, what her book, one of the uh, targets of her book is functional zoning. Se zoning that separates uses. You have residential here, you have commercial here, you have industrial. Separating them out, and this is a 20th century phenomenon, particularly after the mid 20th century. Uh, I mean, it started earlier. It's called Euclidean zoning after what well, Euclid, Ohio, in the 1920s. But it came really uh, popular after World War II, the separation of uses. And she says that can kill cities. This, is, this can cause the death of cities because you don't have that mingling. Streets become deserted after, nine, uh, after 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? And that's deadly. OK, the point here that I'm spending this time is that her looking at cities establishes the city as an institution. It also establishes the complexity of cities through the interaction of factors like this. We cannot predict. She says, you know, we don't know exactly what will occur uh, if, we, if a city has these uh, has these factors, and the factors, she says, may change over time. They may, be, may be different factors in 2020 than they were in 1961. She says, you know, observe how people actually use these spaces and what brings people in. That's what's important, because no matter how advanced the, the, the city and the urbanity becomes, it's really the same principle. Right? People need some kind of contact, people even this day of the internet, and people need to feel safe and secure if they're going to uh, associate with one another. OK, I've already talked about how Jacobsian economics, and I've given you just a taste of it, differs from sort of standard economics. But here, here's a couple of things she says about macroeconomics and microeconomics. And let me just read you this first quote. This comes from um, Cities and the Wealth of Nations, 1984. She says, nations are political and military entities, and so are blocks of nations. But it doesn't necessarily follow from this that they are also the basic salient entities of economic life, or that they are particularly useful for probing the mysteries of economic structure, the reasons for rise and the decline of wealth. So nation states are not units of economic analysis. They're important, right? Setting pol the political units. And we know that political units, like you know, the United States and others, erect tariff barriers, they subsidize exports, and, and, and go to war, which all has economic impacts. But in terms of their economic significance, nation states are irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether goods um, cross the border of the United States or some other country, any more than it matters that somebody drives from Mesa to, to Tempe, or buys, you know, somebody living in Mesa buys from somebody in Tempe. Right. Economically, it doesn't make any difference. Politically, it might make a difference. Right? We don't want those Masons coming over here and interfering with our life. So, I mean, if you don't have a nation state in macroeconomics, a lot of macroeconomics disappears. Not all of it, but a lot of it does. Macroecon Think of monetary policy, right? Think of fiscal policy. Not, not, it's not so important if you ignore the nation state. OK, and then she was uh, harshly critical of microeconomics. Because she saw economics through the lens of the city. And she, ha she says this in her uh, Cities in, uh, in um, the Economy of Cities, 1969. Cities are indeed inefficient and impractical compared with towns it's because of all the experimentation. And among cities themselves, the largest and most rapidly growing at any given time are apt to be the least efficient. But I propose to argue that these grave and real deficiencies are necessary to economic development and are thus exactly what makes cities uniquely valuable to economic life. By this, I do not mean that cities are economically valuable in spite of their inefficiency and impracticality, but rather because they are inefficient and impractical. You have experiment, you have people doing the same thing, 
Right? We just need one business selling dog food. We don't need multiple businesses selling dog food. Right? Why, do, why do we need this? Well, because they're experimenting with what the right dog food is for the right customer. Um, it, what seems like waste uh, actually may turn out to be waste, but it may, may not be waste. It's, it's part of the competitive experimental process. Um, trial and error results in fa failure, right? Trial and error. Uh, and success comes at the end of a long uh, path of failure. And failure means, you know, uh, 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 the detritus of, uh, of, of activity. It's, it's bad smells. Okay? It's, it's noise from bu buildings being torn down and rebuilt. Um, it's, it's inequality of income, right, as people search for that activity, which will get them the most um, return. Um, I don't want to spend much time here. I may be on the question and answer talking about um, Austrian economics. I'll, 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 what I've done here is I've listed some of the principal features of modern Austrian economics. The first three, methodological individualism, methodological subjectivism, and market process come from uh, Pete Betke's companion to Austrian economics. These are, were identified by, by him and the editors as the um, foundations of of uh, Austrian economics. Methodological individualism simply means that you explain social phenomena in terms of individuals' activities. Okay? And Jacobs was certainly that. Right? Eyes on the street. How do people respond to uh, urban designs? Right? The other theme of Jacobs' um, Death and Life of Great American Cities had to do with the relationship between the design of public spaces, streets, sidewalks, plazas, and human behavior. How do they, does it make a difference that you have very narrow sidewalks? Does it make a difference that you ha don't have much lighting? Okay. To the people who are using it. So methodological individualism, definitely. Methodological subjectivism. That is, that what, what is important from the point of view of economics, and Austrian economics in particular, are the perceptions and expectations of people that you're studying. Okay, that's certainly Jacobsian. And market process. I've talked about that. Um, ignorance and imperfect knowledge, role of entrepreneurship, and the knowledge problem. Her critique of central planning at the local level had to do with the fact that urban planners do not have access to what she called locality knowledge. This is knowledge that's available to the people who are living in a particular time and place. Some of that can be communicated to uh, planners, but a lot of it cannot. And so planning is problematic. Uh, Jacobs was not opposed to urban planning. Right? She was not like a you know, libertarian anarchist, certainly not. Okay, but she identified what the problem was with Robert Moses and Ed Bacon in Philadelphia uh, all these big shots uh, in urban planning in the 1950s and 60s. Um, a priorism, uh, meaning that where does the, our knowledge of uh, economics come from? Uh, uh, in the old days, there used to be a lot of uh, Austrians who subscribed to a priorism. Not so much. We don't even really talk about that anymore. Most of us are not. Uh, Jacobs was uh, an inductivist, which is in a way the opposite of a priorism. And the other one, subjective value theory, role of institutions, spontaneous order, critique of central planning, mostly Jacobsian, although she didn't spend much time talking about what she meant by value. And that's a, a critique that I have of hers. She, does, she almost sometimes writes as if um, she believed in a labor theory of value, right? sort of a Ricardian, Marxian uh, theory of value. But other times she didn't, right? Other times she recognized the importance of utility and you know, prices reflect relative scarcity. So it's, this is kind of, so a priorism, subjective value theory, maybe not so much. I think that's pretty good, right? Two out of all of these. All right. Now what's lacking in her framework? Uh, in all of her books, she assumes that people have a lot of economic freedom, but she never articulates that. Um, 
she doesn't really emphasize the nature of competition. She assumes competition exists, right? Why do we need uh, multiple uses? What's the waste? People trying to do the same thing in different ways. All right, that's, that's, that's competition, but she doesn't really articulate a theory of competition. Um, she, does uh, she does express uh, the importance of experiment in cities and trial and error. Uh, I like to um, emphasize the messiness. One of the things that I like to say, and I've uh, uh, written this in, in essays that I've, that I've published, is the following. Any city that aspires to greatness will have something to offend everybody. <laughs> also, so great cities are offensive, either the smells or the sights. You have weird people doing weird things at weird times. Um, and if you're going to want the benefits of cities, the creativity, innovation, you have to tolerate that. Right? Tolerance is necessary if uh, we're going to have great cities and what the great cities produce. Uh, as I said before, she's un it's unclear what she sees as the nature of value. Uh, I, she does recognize the, the feedback role of prices and reflecting relative scarcities, but it, it took her to the year 2000 actually to write about prices, which is, you know, given 39 years, okay, 1961 to 2000. But she did very well. Uh, she's uh, very, uh, she's against subsidies. Um, she's against rent control in most circumstances because she understands what, how, uh, these things distort prices. Um, she doesn't, in, in, I said she coined the term social capital. Uh, so, uh, sociologists and mathematicians have developed theories of, of social capital and social networks. I, one of the first sociologists to do this was Mark Granovetter. He wrote a, a, a very famous essay called The Strength of Weak Ties. The Strength of Weak Ties. And the argument was, if we're gonna have uh, learn something new, it'll probably come from somebody we don't know very well. Because if all your knowledge, if everything that you know comes from people that you know very well, then they probably know what you know and you know what they know. So the, in order to, to learn new stuff, your little social network has to have some tie to an outsider. And that tie to an outsider, by definition, is a weak tie. That is, you don't know very much about that person. So if you are going to advance by gaining new knowledge, you have to be, again, tolerant of difference. You have to be tolerant of people who are socially distant from you, okay, so that you can learn. And then again, once you do that, if you learn something, then that spreads through these weak ties as well. Okay, Jacobs didn't distinguish between strong and weak ties, which is okay, right? Adam Smith didn't have demand and supply curves. We can't uh, blame him for that. Uh, and then finally, her critique of planning is good, right, in the sense she identifies uh, the complexity of the social order as being a, a constraint. She recognizes the limits of knowledge um, as a constraint, but <clears throat> she's not ready to abandon central planning altogether. She thinks that with the right administrative structure, right, which she calls subsidiarity, right? It's a, she didn't coin that term, but subsidiary means you have the uh, low, uh, you have governance at the um, at the level that is closest to the problem. So she advocated for polycentric governance within cities, meaning that most city services could be provided at the district level, not the city level, including public safety, including uh, you know, sanitation, welfare, these kinds of things could be better administered. Right? So she thought that there was a way around uh, locality knowledge. And I, as, uh, as somebody who takes uh, uh, the Mises Hayek critique of central planning very seriously, I have to kind of you know, question that a bit. Okay, Jacobs self-identified as an economist, noted economists acknowledged her economic contributions. She published an article in the AER. Uh, she hits all the points in the central question of economics. She understood the nature and significance of prices, markets, and entrepreneurship, and innovation and economic development. And her insights on the institutional setting for innovation offer a dimension missing from standard theories of economic development. Jane Jacobs was an economist. <laughs> <laughs>
have a bike. <laughs> I, I get here. Teacher wise. You what? I get here. <laughs> you 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 had it. yeah, but no, I get here. I have another mic. Oh, you can hear. Okay, yeah. good. We don't want that mic if it's going to be making that kind of noise. Uh, we usually start with questions from the younger members of the audience um, to make sure they have a space to ask. So, are any students so or are the younger members of the room do you have questions? They can be dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> I will open the floor. Yeah, if you have questions, Cindy's been teaching for Jane 39 Jacobs years. She's used to that. Yeah. <laughs> So other questions then, other questions from the audience. There's one here. Where do you think that Jane, ja um, Jane Jacobs is somebody who is embraced by the extreme left and the extreme right? You have people who are all over the political spectrum. Where would, where would you think that she lies in the political spectrum? And what do you think that she would be in terms of NIMBYism? Because she was also, you know, kind of uncertain. Right. Um, I've heard secondhand, that is from close friends and colleagues of hers, that. Uh, she was sympathetic to NIMBYism. NIMBYism is not in my backyard, buddy. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, people be able to block projects that they don't like. Yeah, they don't want multifamily housing in their neighborhood, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but to answer your question, Jane Jacobs grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Okay, she moved to New York during the Depression, but her background is kind of small townish and I think members of her family are rather conservative both politically right but she wasn't um, she and her sister moved to to Brooklyn actually they live for a time in the neighborhood that I live in right now Brooklyn Heights um, and she met all kinds of people in New York she, she you know Marxists uh, uh, leftist liberals and that was kind of her you know social milieu um, and so I think she, she, her sympathies and the way, reason she got along very well with, I, I belong to, uh, I'm on the board of directors of something called the Center for Living, the Center for the Living City, based in New York City. And it was started by um, close friends and colleagues of hers um, after she died, just after she died. And um, they're all uh, old sort of 1960s left liberals. So I think that was, that was where her sympathies were. She was very much um, in favor of you know, the, the uh, working families and how to Im improve the life of, of the you know, least advantage. And so was Adam Smith, by the way. Right? Adam Smith also had these liberal tendencies. But the difference between her and the others, I think, was that she understood economics. So that her understanding of scarcity and the market processes, the importance of innovation and wealth creation, um, constrained her sort of left liberal tendencies. So she wasn't against rent control, but she said, you know, rent controls are not going to solve the problem. They're not going to build housing. Right? None of houses will be built if you do that. Uh, so yeah, you can have rent control during World War II to prevent gouging, but you should remove it right away. But she criticizes New York for keeping rent control on long after it was quote unquote necessary. Um, so does that, that kind of, I, so I think her, her sympathies were on the left. But you know, her, her understanding of how markets prevented her from sort of going you know, all the way over there. Oh, yes? Could you comment a little on the similarities and differences between her views and I can answer that by saying I'm not sure what Richard Flores' views are today. <laughs> uh, I say that um, Richard Florida is a, an urban economist, very well known. He's written many books. Um, I, I don't know where he is. He was for a time at George Mason University. I don't know where he is now. He might be at Canada. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Peter Gordon, and I wrote a, an article that he cited favorably the Wall Street Journal. So I, you know, <laughs> I, I say that. But, um, but sorry, so let me, seriously. Richard Florida was, as I mentioned, um, influenced by, by Jane Jacobs. 
Um, in what way? Well, he understood the importance of diversity. Um, Joel Garreau would be another one. Uh, but uh, uh, so I, I guess in that sense. But the problem with Richard Florida is, is it, it, he changes his mind a lot, which is not a bad thing. Um, John Maynard Keynes, right, the father of modern macroeconomics, <laughs> used to say in debates, when somebody pointed out, oh, you know, you flip-flopped on this issue. And he always says, well, when the evidence shows that I'm wrong, I change my mind. What do you do? <laughs> so, you know, maybe he's much uh, more uh, open-minded than I am. But I, so I can't really comment too much on that. I like his work on, um, OK, I'll say this. OK, I just remembered something I had written. Uh, Richard Florida has this idea of the creative class, that in order to jumpstart a city, you need to be able to attract people who are creative. These are artists, these are intellectuals, people with you know, graduate degrees, uh, that sort of thing. Bring them into the city, and that will help to foster innovation creativity. Jacobs was not like that. Jacobs said, look, people are, are ordinary people are pretty creative. So what cities do by, by bringing novel information, novel people, the diversity of people and, and diversity of use of space is they empower ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So you don't, it makes people, ordinary people can be creative much more easily, sometimes even without trying very hard. New products, spotting new needs for markets or spotting new you know, goods that they can use to improve their household. They can be very creative that way without bringing in creative people. So that was one difference I would see between them. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned a little bit about uh, her criticism of microeconomic theory, specifically this messiness of trial and error process that we view as inefficiency. Right. Well, when I read that, I thought immediately of polycentricity because if there's anything that's taught us, it's that this redundancy is actually a huge asset because of the types of information it provides. So did her understanding your application of polycentricity end up softening her criticism of microeconomic theory, or how did it change? No, well, polycentricity means, um, very simply, that we mean polycentric, polycentric governance. Right? So for example, in the United States, originally anyway, uh, we had you know, the, the, the federal government, then you had state governments that were, uh, uh, had relative autonomy to, to govern their own states. Right? So it's the polycentric government. That's, that's changed now, so it's all been centralized. At the, at the federal, or most of it, the important stuff has been centralized at the federal level. Within cities, she said, well, districts that, um, you know, you don't know whether or not, um, uh, a, a, um, um, whether the housing density, the FAR, is, is, is too high or too low in an area, but the people who live there might be able to say something about it, or people, the businesses. And, um, so in order to get at that information, um, if, if somebody uh, locally living in a, in a neighborhood uh, wants to do something that he or she thinks is going to improve life, like uh, open a store on the uh, bottom floor of his or her house, okay, sell stuffed animals or something, um, and that this would really liven up the street, or you could sell coffee in your living room rent out rooms, okay? Uh, now you try to communicate that, in a small town you might be able to do it, but in a, in a city of a million people, you have to go through so many layers and your voice may not be heard. And so she said, well let's let that kind of regulation take place at that local level. Empower the, the uh, district to you know, have, have a council leader or whatever to, to address those particular problems. Now, microeconomics problem is, is different um, because what happens in polycentric governance is that, yes, you, you do have experimentation among all the different uh, uh, governance uh, units. And then within each governance unit, you know, there's, there's more give and take. And you can try to find out what it is. The problem with microeconomics is, um, as, as normally um, taught and understood, is that uh, you know, you're assuming in order to get the models to work right, even just demand supply curves, you're assuming that the agents 
um, buyers and sellers have perfect information. Right? There's no, uh, you know, you have this going on. And, and, and all, the, all the important stuff happens where they intersect. You have equilibrium price, you have equilibrium quantity. Um, what my great teacher, Israel Kirzner, used to say is, well, what, what, what is important is the story of how you get to that point. Right? Because we don't have perfect information to begin with. When you, have, when you have an equilibrium, you're assuming that all agents have perfect access, have access to all relevant information. Says, that's not the way it is. Israel made a career out of making this uh, argument. And similarly, Jacobs, she says she recognized the same thing, or very similar thing, that, that people, in order to find what it is they need and what others need, have to, have to experiment. Assuming perfect knowledge doesn't do anything. It's like that joke. A uh, policeman at night sees a guy looking under a street lamp, and he asks the guy, what are you doing? He says, I, I lost my keys. And, and uh, the policeman says, well, where'd you lose them? He says, oh, two blocks away. <laughs> and the policeman says, why are you looking here? He says, because the light's better. <laughs> All right, that's, so equilibrium analysis allows you to answer certain questions, but they may not be the questions that you're interested in. And they did not interest Jacobs at all. Yes. I recognize you. We ate dinner before in Las Vegas. OK. <laughs> Hi. So for a, a big city, a big dynamic little city, the institution of your uh, government-assigned schooling for children may not be a very big cultural influence on the city at large, whereas in a small city, it will have, say, rural Texas, it will have a significant impact on the culture of the city. Um, did Jacobs talk about that in any way? And if so, how would kind of this, this movement we're, we're seeing towards more dynamic school choice um, influence her, her views, or, or how would that fit into her views? Yeah, I, you know, I don't recall reading anything that uh, she had written on this issue, so I can't really speak to her. My gut feeling is that she'd be all in favor of, of school choice. She'd be in favor of charter school. She'd be in favor of, you know, I don't know about privatization. I mean, she grew up in an area when, in an era when public schools really were really effective. And, and um, I mean, she died in 2006, so she she lived long enough to see the failure of public education. But I think, again, that's sort of having leftist sympathies. I think she, you know, would, would want to have some form of public education. But I, but school choice, I think, would fits very much into her schema uh, scheme. And would you say a local school control as well within the, the borough or within the, the sub, sub district? Yeah, yeah. And within, within the district, she, she, she uh, specifically said should have, within the city, should have control over, over schools. Um, in New York City, for various reasons, that was a disaster. <laughs> um, in principle, right? she agreed with it. Uh, here and then here. Oh, sure. Yeah, so uh, did her framework, uh, her analytic framework, have anything to do with her view on things like public transportation? So there, or is there something, so for instance, I can imagine certain aspects of public transportation would sit well with her, but others, like short, you know, short range buses or rickshaw might. might you know? Yeah, that's, so that's, that's interesting. Sure. I'm sorry. She's she didn't write very much yeah. about subways and public transport. Um, That's my question, so you're one person. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, 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 I'm drawing the blank on that. I, I don't. Yeah. Well, well. I mean, yeah. I mean, she was all concerned about uh, right about uh, what. Not, well, both how Robert Moses was creating. Uh, building and constructing highways and roads, and but also what that what the impact that had on the local communities. Um, yeah, so here again, I think she probably was assuming some sort of public transport. Um, in the last two years, I uh, befriended a uh, former chief planner for the World Bank. He uh, now uh, teaches. Uh, his name is Alain Berthaud. 
he now teaches at the New York University in the Marin uh, Institute. And uh, he published a book in 2018, brilliant book, called Order Without Design. And this is his, les his lessons that he's learned in 50 years of urban planning. And you know, he was the urban planner for Chandragar in India. Uh, he was the urban planner in the Middle East. I mean, he designed roads and, and all this sort of thing. Uh, so he, he really knows what he's talking about. Charming man, just a wonderful man. But his whole thing is um, the, the, the role of the government, uh, local governments, uh, really should be focused on housing affordability and, and housing affordability and mobility, not with how people use space. Right? You can build the roads, build the infrastructure, but telling people you can't o open a beauty parlor here because it doesn't fit the zoning, or you can't open a shop, you know, uh, in, you know, in or near your home, which, which isn't hurting anybody, and which doesn't, you know, uh, emit fumes and, and bothersome noises. The government had no, no role in that, right? he's, he's realized over time. So with respect to mobility, uh, he says, well, <clears throat> you know, look at, look at what uh, uh, in developing countries, you know, they've done, the jitneys. Uh, there are these tuk-tuks. Uh, They're like golf carts yeah. that pick you up at the train station, and it's just lined up, and you get into the tuk. So the, the, what, what subways and trains and even highways do a good job of is getting you through macro distances. You travel miles and miles. Once you get to the terminus, that's where the problem is. Okay, so you have to get from the, the station to wherever you're going. And often where you're going is multiple stops. You're not just going home. You're going shopping, you're picking up the kids, and you're checking on something else, and then, then maybe you're going home. So you need a way of uh, facilitating mobility and he said, well, a lot of developing countries do this. And we see that you know, here in, in, in Tempe, we have the scooters and things like which you know, can be a menace. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a way of, of promoting. And it's not the end story. Right? Cities are always evolving. Um, the title of my book is A City Cannot Be a Work of Art. And that comes from Jacobs. That's a quote from Jacobs. And one of the reasons it can't be a work of art is because it's an artist, once, once he or she's finished a painting, right, it goes on the wall, it's done. That's, that's not what a city is. A city's like, like an organism. Right? It is a kind of organism that, that changes and that uh, when, uh, can be immortal uh, if, if done right. So anyway, you have the, these, these evolving things happening. So you know, if you don't like something that's being done now, if it's causing hazard, well, just wait a minute and we'll, and we'll see. And so he's, he's really excited about autonomous cars. Uh, and he says that people are focusing on the wrong question. It's not, it's, people often say, well, will there, will there be more cars or fewer cars if there are autonomous vehicles? He says, it doesn't matter whether there are more or fewer. What matters is how fast you can get from point A to point B okay, and accomplish all these multiple stops. Which means, in other words, and he thinks that, more, that autonomous vehicles, because you can drive them so close together you know, on the side, that they would, they would operate much like trains okay, or big buses. Like big buses are great for moving people. Right? Even if there are only six people on the bus, that beats ten car, well, six cars. Uh, and you can't fit six cars in the space of a bus. So the, the problem with buses is the distances between them and the fact that they do not vary their route very easily, which is what jitneys have the advantage of. But anyway, so he thinks like this, and, um, which, is, which is brilliant. He's 80 years old, and he's brilliant, just thinking, what, what, what kinds of alternatives are there to um, enable people to have mobility and housing affordability? It's not so much, it, it, mainly, how do you get to your job? What's, what, uh, what, what, what uh, kinds of, what, that's, what's the cheapest way to get to your job? The more mobile you are, the more housing is affordable, the better the job you can get, get to. If you're stuck in, a, in public housing where you can't earn over a certain amount and, you, and you're offered a job right there that, that's on the other side of the town, so you can't take it because then you lose your housing. Uh, or if it's too far because of traffic jams and so forth, that's, that's going to reduce the uh, wealth generating capacity of the city. 
uh, mobility and housing affordability. And the two things are related to each other. Being able to afford a house closer to work is, is mobility as well. Anyway, sorry. Did, sorry and and no, that answer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention her final book, which I think she kind of Dark Age Ahead. Yeah. Coming Dark Age? Yeah. Dark Age Ahead. Dark Age Ahead. It's sort of a bucket. It seems to me a lot of her stuff, she talks almost as much about the, the, the falling apart, the decline of cities and civilization as she does about how it grows. Where she gets a lot of that, I think, is from a guy named Henry Farine, uh, the uh, Belgian historian, medievalist, died in about. Oh, oh, Henri Perrin, yes. Perrin. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can never pronounce it French. Uh, she yeah, she was inspired by, by Henri Perrin, uh, a historian, an economic historian of medieval, European medieval cities. Yeah, uh, um, some of that. Um, I recently reread it, it, Dark Age Ahead is my least favorite of her books. Well, it's a little dispiriting. It, it's, you know, <laughs> the title suggests. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a warning not to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on a lot of it. One of the things that, that sticks out in my mind, actually, in that book, she makes this point about macro versus micro mobility. Uh, it, it's a lot of. Um, this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I already said it's my least favorite book, so here we go. I, um, I'm told by her son, I, she, has, she has a daughter and two sons, and I met the two sons, and not the daughter, that um, when she was writing her other books, she said there was a lot of torn up pages in the wastebasket. But when she wrote this last one, there wasn't. And I got this, I get, you get the sense when you read it that like, she's putting in there everything that she thought about. And it doesn't really mesh together. Uh, but one of the things she talks about is, uh, well, I think she talked about the decline of the nuclear family or something like that. But also the rise of credentialism. Or she picks up like these six factors that you would never think is responsible for the decline of civilization. Like you, you think like inflation right, would be one of these, but not. Um, one is credentialism, right? and uh, meaning that you know you have to have a degree or a license to do this. Maybe so licensure may have been an issue here. In her case, it's interesting because um, she's not an academic. She didn't graduate from college. Um, she attended uh, when she was in New York. She took courses at Columbia University as a non-matriculated student. And then they kicked her out because she wouldn't matriculate. She just wanted to take courses that she enjoyed. Um, and so she was, that's one of the reasons she was ignored by prof professional economists. She, was, she didn't have a PhD in economics, and, and she didn't have an academic pos position. She was a public intellectual. Death and Life of Great American Cities was rated as one of the 100 most important books, written nonfiction books in the 20th century. And that's how important her, her voice became. Yet she was this non-credential housewife, right? Who, uh, much more than that. But uh, so that's part of it. So people are are prevented from advancing simply because they don't have the right credential. This this can lead to disaster. But she says other things in there that are equally depressing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back here, and then then Scott. Um, was she talking? About inequality? In cities? About inequality? Yes. A little bit. In, um, in one of the criticisms that her people on the left had against her is that she didn't talk enough about, um, uh, in the United States, the Negro question. Okay? Although she does talk about it a little bit. Um, In uh, cities, sorry, in the economy of cities, her book in 1969, she says this thing, which I think is really brilliant and provocative. She says, poverty has no causes. Only wealth has causes. In other words, poverty is the default condition of mankind. If you're going, and, and, and so it's, it's like 
you know, it's like vac the va a vacuum. That's that's the default condition. Or or you know, cold. Coldness is the lack of heat. She said, well, so what? So to have a theory of poverty, she says this explicitly. To have a theory of poverty puts, points you in the wrong direction. What you need to have is a is a theory of prosperity, and that's what she provided. So if you, what makes, you know, what is what has caused the prosperity of mankind? Um, well, uh, innovation. Where's the locus of innovation? Locus of innovation is cities. Therefore, we have to, you know, don't. We don't have to promote cities because they sort of naturally happen. But now there are things that will hinder cities. So she was all in favor of wealth creation. I probably felt uncomfortable about extreme inequality as well. She probably would have had something to say about that. I just haven't read anything she said about that. Um, I tell this to my students. Where the, the, uh, Homo sapiens are, what, 250,000 years? old or so, roughly. And um, cities did not exist. That is to say, large settlements. Even farming did not exist until about 10,000 BC or so, right, right after the Little Ice Age. Um, and so large settlements didn't arise until about um, 9,000 BC. Uh, and, and then around 7,500 BC, 8,000 BC, you have uh, large settlements, like thousands and thousands of people uh, establishing in, in India, and a little bit later in the Middle East, in, in, in Turkey. And then all hell breaks loose at that point, right? You have uh, literacy, you have numeracy. You have religion, organized religion. You have governments being established, right? Then you have Mesopotamia, right, in the, in the uh, third, um, third millennia of, third or fourth millennia of Mesopotamia, on the Ur, and, uh, Uruk, and all these uh, other Middle Eastern, uh, in, in the in the Fertile Crescent. So, in, in this space of time, this very small space of time, let's say in the last twelve thousand years, everything we know about that if that's familiar about humanity is created. You go from nomadic hunter gather tribes to this. And she said, it all, what, what happened was uh, cities happened. We'd still be uh, uh, nomadic tribes, tribal nomadic hunter gatherers now if it weren't, if it weren't for cities. So I imagine, uh, I tell my students, you know, how many times in that 250,000 years did people want to settle and trade with each other, but just couldn't? Right? Either because you know they were too busy throwing rocks at each other, uh, or the trade was very, very limited. But at some point, right, two strangers got together and they traded, and that stuck. Right? And it's, but it, it probably took a quarter of a million years before that finally happened. Not, not just that it happened, but that it, 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 it stuck. And then once it stuck, people saw, oh, living in cities, you know, we, we can do this. Uh, and, and, uh, because uh, you know, the population of the world about the year 10,000 BC was you know, maybe a million people or so. Mm -hmm. But even, even then, there was probably an Einstein. Right? There's probably genius, you have geniuses living uh, amongst the hunter-gatherers, but they just weren't able to, you know, if, if they couldn't, you know, down a mastodon, uh, then it's, it's no good. They may have been brilliant mathematicians if there was such a thing as math. But you didn't have math, numeracy, calendrical sciences, until you had cities. Oh, last question. Uh, well, I, first of all, I just want to say briefly that, that that point about the need to explain prosperity but not Poverty is very closely related to Hayek's point about the need to explain how we succeed, but not how we fail, right? right? Yeah. Um, but the, right, the context of business cycles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, exactly. Um, the question that I wanted to ask was, uh, and maybe this is an appropriate way to end this, a little bit of a personal note. Um, what, 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 what makes you interested in Jacobs? What has made you interested in Jacobs in your career? What has led you into the economics of 
cities, it's apparent from some perspective of someone who's you're one of your Facebook friends that you are a great lover of New York City and, and of cities more generally. So I'm just curious whether the love came first and then the interest in Jacobs came next, or how did it, how did it work? Uh, when I was growing up, the only big city we ever went to was Los Angeles. Right? So I always had a, uh, uh, that was my image of, 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 of cities, you know, Chinatown on Los Angeles, Japantown on Los Angeles. And so I liked it. Um, so when I had a chance to live in New York um, and go to school at a, a New York University and study with Israel Kirzner and Mario Rizzo and Jerry O'Driscoll and Larry White, uh, I did. And, but in terms of, my, my dissertation had to do with antitrust economics. Um, and then <clears throat> I wrote a book, uh, my one book so far, on, on um, dynamics of interventionism. Okay. It had nothing really to do with cities. So what happened was when I was a graduate student, um, early 1980s, uh, I bought Death and Life for Great American Cities at the Strand bookstore. Because a lot of my libertarian friends, oh, you know, that's a good book. So yes, yeah, so I bought it. I put it on the shelf, and for ten years it sat there. <laughs> um, and then I, I published um, Dynamics of the Mixed Economy, and two people. One, well, Pete Betke, who is a, a professor at George Mason University, and actually um, was a couple of years younger than me at Grove City, said, you know, you should try to translate your uh, interventionism story uh, applied to, to cities. And then um, a, a colleague uh, named Pierre Desrochers, who's at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, said, you have to read Jacobs. It's almost the same time. So I said, OK, so I pulled it down. And I read it. And the first sentence of Death and Life of Great American Cities was, this book is an attack on urban planning and city rebuilding. <laughs> and you thought, yes. I said, oh, where are you going to keep reading this? And then as I read it, I realized all these, com you know, this comparison with the Austrian economics, right? The, did, did she read Hyatt before? No. Before printing that? Because it just yeah. seemed so similar. She I mean, never like, cites Hayek. Um, but, but, <laughs> Says the night scholar. <laughs> or night. <laughs> or night. Yeah, yeah. But that was a given. <laughs> you know, as I was reading through the book, uh, all these points, especially um, yeah. knowledge problem, yeah. Yeah. ignorance of perfect knowledge, um, and critique of central planning. Right? She was identifying the very things that Mises and Hayek were identifying in macroeconomics, the fail, why socialism, why central planning, collectivist central planning fails. It's identical, almost identical. But she came at it from a completely different perspective. She's inductivist through observation of cities. And they didn't. So in, I realized that the things I was learning about entrepreneurship and market process from Israel Kirsner fit right into this too. Except that what Jacobs was doing was giving sort of the mechanics and institutional setting of entrepreneurship. She, she doesn't use the term entrepreneurship, but it, 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 my, my book talks about the formation of social networks and how that promotes entrepreneurship and, and so forth. So, yeah, so the, that's, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. well, let's, let's, uh, thank Sandy for his talk. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here.